told Becky last night we were traveling home from Michigan. Uh, went there for a couple days to help uh, Becky's younger sister and a brother-in-law in finishing their house that they just purchased and needed uh, a lot of work. And I said to her, you know, a couple co different commentaries both said that Genesis 12 is the most important passage in Genesis, maybe even in the Bible. And I have to preach on that passage tomorrow. <laughs> talk about intimidating. But I'm excited to be here with you in our journey through the book of Genesis. And I want to start out in this message entitled Faith's Sojourn. And I want to focus on a contrast that the author of Genesis has presented us in Genesis 1 through 12, a contrast. And this contrast is between life and death. Everybody say that. Life and and death. Okay, that's very important to catch. We've just come out of Genesis 3 through 11, and in that cluster of chapters, the author of Genesis has shown us what life looks like when God steps back. God says, okay, you want to do it your way, I'm going to let you do it your way, and I'm going to step back, and I want all the readers to take a look at what happens there. I shared last week, it's like looking at a house that doesn't have God in existence. And if you peek in through the windows of that house, what you'll see is hell. That's the idea. You will see a godless place. C.S. Lewis has famously said that in the end, there are only two types of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, Thy will be done. So it's the first set that said, Lord, we want what you want. It's the second set that says, we want what we want. And so God says to them, your will be done. You will get a world that doesn't have God in it. And it's a place called hell. So Genesis 3 through 11 is essentially a picture of hell before they're actually there. We see all types of terrible things in these chapters. And the basic message of Genesis 3-11 through is this. When you walk away from life, you can only be walking in death. When you walk away from life, you can only be walking in death. And that's what it'll look like. I re recently saw on a Facebook post, I think Sharon Thompson shared it, and it was a picture, it was a, a series of images of those who had gone the way of drugs. And it just showed different face shots of these individuals with their journey with drugs. And I got to tell you, it was one of the most horrifying things I've personally ever seen. Watching a person essentially come and look at, look as though they were a demon by journey's end. What the drug does to them, even just their body, let alone their soul. This is essentially what we have in Genesis 3. But it's a very particular point the author of Genesis is trying to make. Here's what he's trying to do. He's trying to say, here's the question you have to answer. Was Satan telling the truth when he said, life would be better if you were like God. That's the question that Genesis 3-11 through is meant to answer. Was Satan telling the truth? Did Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve have a reason to be discontented in the garden? That's the question. We've seen Genesis 1 and 2, and it's depicted with good being said seven times over. It's depicted with Adam and Eve being in their most vulnerable states, nakedness, and being unashamed. So that's how Genesis 1 and 2 is pictured. That's how God created the world in this pristine fashion where there's no shame, there's no fear, there's no regret, there's no, no sin, there's nothing like that perfect harmony between humanity and, and the animal kingdom and the earth itself, everything the way God created it to be. So you got to ask the question, is Genesis 1 and 2 worse than Genesis 3 through 11? That's all the author wants you to answer. That's all he wants you to get. And after you get through Genesis 11, you should say, Satan lied. 
earth, humanity. It's not better when man is on the throne. It was better when God was on the throne. That's the idea. Thomas Watson, the 17th century Puritan, wrote this, Satan loves to fish in the troubled waters of a discontented heart. Satan loves to fish in the troubled waters of a discontented heart. And see, this is where Satan escorted Adam and Eve to. He brought them to a place of discontentment. He brought them to a place that, did God really do it best? Or can I somehow tweak what He did? Can I make it better? So He brought them to a state of discontentedness, and the moment they entered that state, they ate from the fruit, and they said, we'll do it our way. So Genesis 1-2 is contrasted with Genesis 3-11. through Life is contrasted with death. We need to just stop a second and say, how practical is this? Well, it's very practical. Any time you and I are tempted to sin, we are choosing between life and death. What we're choosing between. So this is very practical. How can we, how can we picture? If we were to assign a picture to Genesis 1 and 2 and Genesis 3 through 11, what sort of image would we want to see Well, again, Thomas Watson has said it very well, and he's talking about eternity here, but I think it works well with Genesis 1 through 11 and breaking up Genesis 1 and 2 to 3 to 11. Look at what he says. Eternity, catch this, eternity to the godly is a day that has no sunset. Eternity to the wicked is a night that has no sunrise. See, Genesis 1 and 2 could be pictured experientially as a day that had no sunset. It was just a beautiful time in God's creation. Whereas Genesis 3 through 11 could be typified or pictured as a night that has no sunrise. To me, a helpful way to picture the contrast between Genesis 1 and 2 and Genesis 3 through 11. The author is simply showing us that Satan is a liar. Life does not go better when we go outside of God's boundaries, go outside of God's parameters, His good, pleasant lines that He's drawn for us. Of course, as a pastor, I'm dealing constantly with people who want to go outside of those boundaries because they think outside of the fence that God's pleasantly placed, it's better. Whether that's in a divorce whether that's in in addiction, whether that's in money, variety of other places trying to say it's not better there. It's not better there. You'll learn that far too quickly after you get out of this fence. So this is what the author is seeking to show us. Satan's a liar. It was better when God was on the throne. It's essentially, for those of you who've seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, and and, and in It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey gets shown what life would be like without him there. Genesis 3-11 through is essentially a picture of what life would be like without God there. And as you know in It's a Wonderful Life, the the town of Pottersville, um, or uh, now I'm forgetting, it gets turned to Pottersville, right? Uh, What was the first name? Bedford Falls, yeah, that's right. You see that transition from one town to the other. And it's an awful transition. And that's what Genesis 2 to Genesis 3 is meant to show us. But what's incredible is that when God re-enters, when God steps back in, as it were, in the world, and we know He was always there, even through Genesis 3-11, through I've tried to painstakingly show you that God is even in there in the darkness making promises that there's glimmers of light even in the extreme darkness of 3-11. through But when God comes back in this scene definitively, clearly, taking the reins back for Himself, it's in Genesis 12, 
And what do you see start coming out of God's mouth the moment he takes the reins back? Well, it sounds just like Genesis 1 through 2 again. What does he start promising? Life, blessing, goodness, good things for the world. So God, you see who God is. God says, look, I am a cosmically good God in Genesis 1 and 2. And when I come in Genesis 12, I will again be a cosmically good God. Because I'm going to take Abram, I'm going to take this acorn, and I am going to make a forest of oaks. I am going to bring blessing to all the world once again. It's been tainted with darkness. I'm going to make it all light everywhere. That's the idea. It sounds just like Genesis 1 and 2 again in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And he gives this good news to a peon named Abram, a nobody, so that God can show that he alone is a somebody. Jim Elliott said, all we are is a bunch of nobodies, small case N, trying to exalt somebody, large case S. So, Abram is faced, this is our transition into the next stage of the message here, Abram is faced with being a settler or a sojourner. A settler or a sojourner. You see, God's first words to Abram, or word to Abram, is go. Go. And if you're an astute reader of Genesis, you know that that word, again, is a contrast from what we've previously seen. Because what have we just seen? Well, we've seen that the whole world amassed and came together at a place called Babel. And what did they do there? They settled. They settled. And then we read of Abram, even, in his family, that they settled in Haran. But this, this should trouble the reader when we read the word settled. Because what we find is we find that Cain settled, but we find that God created the world for what? For man to Fill it, multiply, and fill the earth. Essentially, claiming every corner for God's glory. So God created sort of His temple, Eden, and man and woman were meant to work together to spread God's glory, spread His temple, to essentially take out the stakes of the tent and, and broaden the tent all across the earth with God's glory. But instead, we find mankind settling. They're coming together and they're staying in one place. So it shouldn't surprise us when God enters the scene, the first thing He says to 75-year-old Abram is go. Go. I want to spread out. This is the idea. i got to pause here a second because, friends, I want to tell you, as uncomfortable as that word for Abram was Go, so God frequently calls us outside of our comfort place like Abram had his. Friends, I want you to be honest with yourself. I want you to ask yourself, are you comfortable going outside of your comfort zone? You see, I find that it's challenging for people in the church to invite new people to their homes. It's challenging for people in the church to open their homes. It's challenging for people in the church to go to new people's homes. See, friends, from the time that we're young, We like what we like, and we don't want that to move. We don't want that to shift. We don't want our horizons to be broadened. We just want to stick with the status quo. That's what we like. What I want to caution you in regard to that is God is a God who calls you outside of what you're comfortable with so He can show uh, His glory in a variety of places with a variety of people. And when you don't want to do that, you are likely in a place where you are erecting your own kingdom and you're not living in God's kingdom. 
I want to caution you about that. And when you live in your kingdom where everything is just the way you like it and everything is just the way you want it and it's all under your control, you are resisting God's frontier where He's always good, but He's never safe. i got to just pause a second and say, isn't Christianity itself meant to be a, like a snake, a shedding of skin after a shedding of skin? Aren't we to daily be leaving what's comfortable to us? Listen, what was formerly comfortable to most of us in this room is dishonesty, is gossip, is greed, envy, lust, anger, hatred, enmity. These are all the, the paths that were well-worn in our lives before Christ. But then Christ comes and He says, I've got new paths for you to walk on. And they look like peace. They look like harmony. They look like joy. They look like love. They look like kindness, gentleness. But we find ourselves, I find myself so frequently veering back to the old paths. Just like I can get my back adjusted and in the same day it goes out of adjustment again. You see, friends, life was meant to be a series of shedding of skin. And that's not comfortable. That's painful. But you need to know that's what's supposed to be happening. We are not supposed to look the, the same we do today 20 years from now. It's not the way God meant it to be. We are to be being transformed from degree of glory to degree of glory to where we look like God looks again. All the distortions in our personality and our relationship history, it's all supposed to change. It's all supposed to be redefined, recreated by God. But it isn't painless. It is painful. And I think the author of Genesis wants to stress just how painful Abram's leaving was. Look at how he describes it. Genesis 12.1 Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. Do you see three times over he stresses? Here's what I want you to leave. I want you to leave the United States, essentially to Abram. I want you to leave your extended family. I want you to leave your very home. This is painful. And he, at this point, doesn't even tell him where he's going. He says, I'm going to take you to the land that I will show you. Friends, Abram's 75 years old. The 75-year-olds I know struggle with unknowns. They want predictability. They want regularity. I have a pastor friend who's older than me, and he, he's always about, man, I just can't wait to get back to my rhythm. He'll be on vacation, and he's excited to get back home to get back to his rhythm. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? And now I'm there. I love getting back to the office. I love it. I love regularity. This is who Abram is, but God is calling him out of that to something he doesn't, even, he's, he doesn't even know where he's going yet. I shared that we went to Michigan for the last couple days, and on the way home, some of you who woke up earlier this morning might have seen the dense fog. Well, on the way home, it was an extremely dense fog on the highway. And for those of you who have experienced that, you know that you get to a place where all you try to do is find a car that's several yards ahead of you, to where you can see their taillights and see if they're still moving and their brake lights aren't coming out, and you just follow that car. And that's essentially what Abram is doing. He cannot see even several yards ahead of him, and God is saying, you just keep an eye on my taillights. You follow me, and I will take you to the land that you're just supposed to be in. The exact spot. Kenneth commentary, uh, commentator Kenneth Matthews puts it this way, I will show you is the only roadmap that Abram can follow. 
I will show you is the only road map that Abram can follow. But I want you to catch this because this is so incredibly crucial. Do you see what God has done? This is so brilliant. God has essentially placed Abram back in the Garden of Eden with the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil right in front of him. Do you see how he's done this? He's saying, listen, you are to follow me in a place that only I can lead you. Just like the tree of knowledge of good and evil, to not eat from it was to say, God, I trust your definition of good and evil. So for Abram to follow God and and, and trust that God knows where he's supposed to take him, that is essentially Abram not eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil again. It's Abram saying, I trust your good. I trust your evil. And as soon as Abram says that, what does God do? Well, he has, again, somebody in his what? Image. Because he's following God wholeheartedly, trusting God's design. And the moment somebody does that, they fall back in place of being in God's image all over again. This is the idea. It's huge in Genesis. And when Abram is in God's image, What is God going to do through Abram? Well, he's going to do what he was going to do through Adam and Eve. Namely, he's going to multiply blessings and life and goodness all over again through Abram. What Adam, the mantle that Adam and Eve dropped, the torch that they dropped, Abram in faith will pick up once again. And as he follows God wholeheartedly, he will look like God again. He'll reflect his image. So what this does is it takes us back to God's original design. God's saying, I'm taking the reins back from mankind. And I'm going to have this this common clay of a human being. And he's going to reflect my image. Because he's going to follow me by grace. Look at God's promise that he gives to Abram. He says, I'm going to take you to the land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God is gracious to give Abram a panoramic view of his eventual glory that he's going to take him to. He's going to show, he shows him the glorious frontier that he's putting before him in his call. And is it ever glorious? Friends, what God is essentially promising in Genesis 12, 1-3 is I'm going to take you back to Eden. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm promising to do. I'm taking you back to Eden. And of course, this was the promise from Genesis 3.15 but it's getting, it's getting more dimensions. It's getting a, we're getting a clearer picture of it in Genesis 12, 1-3. So he's showing life. He's showing blessing. Now there's so much wrapped up in this. He says, you're going to be a great nation. I'm going to make of you a great name so that you'll be a blessing. Those who bless you, I'll bless. Those who curse you, I'll curse. And all the families of the earth will be blessed in you. Now I want to just pause a second and I want to step back so we don't, these are all the trees, but what's the forest? Friends, I just encourage you to count in your Bibles how many times it says from Genesis 12, 1 to 3, I will. You know, let the cat out of the bag. You'll count five of them. God says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Emphasis on the I. I will. I will, I will, I will, I will. This is the idea. God is making a promise that nobody can mess with, not even Abram. I will commit to do this regardless of how bad you screw up. I am committing to do this. Now, if you want to get on the glory train with me, you're welcome to do that, and I'm holding out a ticket. And if you fall off the train, you can get back on through repentance and turning from your ways and come back and I'll I'll take you back. 
This is the idea. So we want, to know, we want you to know that God is the one doing this, but beyond that, we got to ask, what is the purpose behind all these promises? What's the purpose? He says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. We know that He does that. Israel becomes numbering in the millions. So we know that this small, barren man and woman will go to become millions. So we know that He does that. We know that He makes Abram's name great. Even in His own day, He does that. We we see God uh, curse those who come against Abram and bless those who bless Abram. We see that. But what's the purpose behind it all? What's the idea? And here's what I want you to catch again. Now he's got somebody that's in his image because he's following God. What did God want to do with that image? He wanted the image of himself to be what? Multiple. He wanted the earth to be filled with images of him because he's the only good that exists. So out of Abram, being like an Adam, he wants to replicate his image into all the families of the earth. That's the idea. And so when you look at Israel, when you look at Abram, the the father of Israel, God is essentially saying this, I'm offering to the rest of mankind a subscription. And this subscription is to the Israel times. It's to the Abram times. Okay? And as you watch the nation of Israel, you will see something just changed drastically. It wasn't purposefully intentional. Like, but you will see what I'm like. Israel, catch this, will be a revelatory vehicle to show you who I am. Because here's the deal. Satan distorted who I am. He convinced Adam and Eve that I was actually against them, that I was a spoil sport. He, he multiplied my commands and he lessened my blessings and my generosity. Satan convinced mankind that God's against them. And friends, if you don't think this still exists, you're wrong. Everybody who's not a Christian up to this point believes that if they become a Christian, will their joy get increased or decreased? They believe it will all go down. It's exactly what they believe. They are believing a satanic lie. And I hate to say it, but a lot of Christians help them believe that lie. That was the lie that God is seeking to eradicate. It's what He's trying to do. And He says, so Satan distorted. He blurred my image. But now I want to show you what I'm really like. So I'm going to show you, just like I was a God of Genesis 1 and 2, who brought good things into being and, and heaped blessing on mankind, so I'm going to bring things, good things into being again, and I'm going to heap blessing on mankind all over again. That's what he's seeking to do. So he says, look at Israel. Watch Israel. And as you watch Israel, you will see what type of God I am. Friends, Israel was meant to be the top cup of a wine glass pyramid that as you fill the first glass, that glass was to overflow and all the liquid was to go down and trickle down into all the other glasses so that the entire pyramid would be filled. That's what Israel was. That's the idea. They were to bless. Because God would bless them, they were to bless all the nations of the earth as a revelatory image of God. See, because here's the thing. Getting to know God is the blessing. Amen? It's not the, it's not the peripheral stuff that comes with Abram that is the blessing. The true blessing is that Abram walked with God. And that walk can be given to us. As we watch Israel and as we watch specifically Israel's God, I want, you to, I want you to just catch this. If you took my Bible and you started flipping through all the pages in the Bible, you would see an image that keeps coming up over and over and over and over and over and over and over on all the pages of my Bible. 
And that image is a simple thing. It's a circle with some rough continents drawn into it. And what that is, is it's earth. And I draw it on every page or every, by every sentence that I find that God's plan was to reach the nations. All the nations. That God's paradigm is to reach everyone. And He meant to do it through Israel. And so you'll see little globes all over my, the pages of the Bible. Because I want to get in my mind that God is about the nations. Look it, look it, look it. It's why God gave Israel the law. He gave Israel the law, not just for Israel, but to bless the nations. Look at Deuteronomy 4.6. Gives them the law. He says, keep them and do them. For that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Do you see? God wanted, by Israel keeping the law, to bless all the nations as they saw Israel keeping the law. It's why God rescued Israel from Egypt. Look at what it says in Exodus 7, 4-5. Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt, my great acts of judgment. Look at The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. So, Israel is a revelatory object so that all the nations will see God through Israel. Look at uh, Joshua 4, 21-24. This is why God brought Israel out of Egypt into the Promised Land. What He says, Joshua is taking them into the Promised Land. When your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? This is the stones from the Jordan River that 12 elders were meant to put out as a monument to show that God brought them into the promised land. He says, but the day is going to come where kids are saying, hey dad, what's, what, what's that pile of stones about? What do they mean? And you shall let your children know. Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over. As the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which He dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So they enter the Canaan land. They enter the promised land. And while they're in there, they turn from God, and God warns them to turn back. Why? For the nation's sake. For His image's sake. For His glory's sake. Look at what He says in Jeremiah. He sends prophets to them. He says, If you return, O Israel, declares the Lord, to Me, you should return. To me, you should return. If you remove your detestable things from my presence and do not waver, and if you swear as the Lord lives in truth, in justice, and in righteousness, look it, then nations shall bless themselves in Him. In Him they shall glory. You see, God is seeking for all the nations to reflect His image just like Abram is. Eventually, this is why the very reason why he moves them out of the promised land when they don't return to him. He moves them out of the promised land so that the nations will see his glory. Look at I will Ezekiel 39. I will set my glory among the nations, God says, and all the nations shall see my judgment that I have executed and my hand that I have laid on them. The house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. And the nations shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they dealt so treacherously with me that I hid my face from them and gave them into the hand of their adversaries. And they fell; they all fell by the sword. You see, Israel was meant to be about the nations. This is the idea. God has not abandoned His mission from Genesis 1.28. Fill the earth and multiply in My image. That's the idea. It's why He sent His own Son through the people Israel so that we might be perfected and completed in His image. This is why God started the work in Genesis 12. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, and we all with unveiled face, behold the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image 
from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So friend, do you see? God called Abram so that you would be transformed into the image of God. That's why He called Abram. That's why He did His work to move us from degree of glory to degree of glory. This is so helpful for for me to understand Romans 3.23, such a popular verse, and it took me so long to fully grasp it. For all have sinned. (laughs) For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God is seeking to help us regain that glory. Not just Abram and Israel, but all the peoples of the earth. Why? Why? so that we could have this image in Revelation 7, 9-12. Take a look at this picture. John says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This is what God sought to accomplish through Abram. And it's happening right now got to ask ourselves, to what degree of glory am I transformed to right now? And is that changing from day to day? Or have I been at this degree for some time now? So this is the unbelievable, earth-shaking news that Abram gets in Haran at 75 years old, tempted to be in settler syndrome, And he's got how long of a journey from Haran to the Canaan land? Oh, it's only 800 miles. This is the journey that God calls Abram to. And it's a helpful mileage because it's about how far the earth has to change to get back to where it was. Amen? So you've got to ask the question, how does Abram do with this unbelievable promise. And it's just glory, glory, glory. And then, he opens his eyes in Canaan, and where does God bring him? Where does He bring him? He brings, he brings him to the, or, the oak of Moray. What's the oak of Moray? Well, it's a famous tree, likely, And it's probably, as was in the ancient customs, a place where pagan rituals took place. You see, when there was an old tree, the the pagans would think, maybe this is the tree of life. And so we're going to worship here at this tree. And so they would have orgies and things of the like at those locations. It was a secular place. They would see it as a place where heaven and earth met. The navel of the earth, as it were. Mediums of oracles would be here. Fertility cults, as I said. So, you got you got to just catch this. Abram gets this unbelievable promise. And it's like, you just picture him kind of like closing his eyes, praising the Lord these 800 miles, and then he opens his eyes, and there's paganism everywhere. And he, it even goes further. The author says in Genesis 12.6, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. So it's like, okay, I was in the already, but now I'm in the not yet. you got to ask, how does Abram handle that? Because friends, don't we, aren't we in this moment? We are promised glory to come, but our kids spill stuff on our pants and everything goes wrong lots of times. We feel the already in our hearts, but we open our eyes and we see the not yet. We see awfulness everywhere around us and in us still. I'll tell you, for me, the not yet 
is an incredibly depressing place for Ben Lovelady. As I see obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, not just in individuals' lives and in my own life, but in church life, family life. And I can tell you, and those close to me can tell you, that I struggle with a depressed way of life in the doldrums. Always picking on the thing that not, is in the not yet instead of looking at the things that God's already accomplished. One singer said, I um, never choose to count my blessings, but I choose instead to dwell on my disaster. That tends to be who I am. There's a story of Martin Luther that at a time in his life, he was just struggling and struggling with depression. He wasn't heeding the counsel and the encouragement of his wife, Katharina. And it said that as he was in this state for some time, Katharina came out and she was dressed in a black dress. Luther said to her, are you going to a funeral? Which she replied, well, I'm not going to a funeral. But since you act like God is dead, I wanted to join you in That's pretty funny. Is my mic cutting out, Alex? So, this is the idea that we live in a place as though God is dead. Abram opens his eyes in Canaan and it looks like God's dead. He's not there. So how does Abram respond to this promise of God? Does he become depressed? Does he get down? How does he respond in the not yet? Look at what he does in Genesis 12, 7-9. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. Friends, i got to tell you, there are a lot of beautiful pictures in Genesis, but to me this might be the most beautiful that we've seen yet. Picturing 75-year-old Abram walking through a land that is not yet conquered, that is not yet filled with the glory of God, and everywhere Abram goes, he just offers up worship to God. And he essentially claims all these spots with an altar, saying eventually this will be a place that gives glory to God. It's not yet now. This tree is used for anything but, but I'm going to make my altar right next to this tree, and one day this tree will get cut down and this altar will stand. See, friends, I don't know if you go through your life that way. So many times, I don't. I don't believe that God's bringing everything to good completion. I've shared before that we're reading through the Chronicles of Narnia with the kids, and one of my favorite characters is a little mouse named Reepicheep. And it's just so funny. Every time Reepicheep says something, like when everyone else doesn't want to do something, the moment Reepicheep opens his mouth, everyone's like, oh, because I know what he's going to say. He's going to say, let's go. Let's do this. They're all being a bunch of cowards. There comes a place in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader where they don't want to go on. I want you to look at what Reepicheep says at this place in the boat. He says, my own plans are made. While I can, I sail east in Dawn Treader. When she fails me, I paddle east in my coracle. When she sinks, I shall swim east with my four paws. And when I can swim no longer, if I have not reached Aslan's country or shot over the edge of the world in some vast cataract, I shall sink with my nose to the sunrise. You see, friends, when we are so easily discouraged, may God send a person in our life like Reepicheep. I shared that we were helping uh, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law in their house, and it was, uh, it was just a grueling couple days of, of hard work trying to get their house to where they needed to be to move in. And I'm older than my brother-in-law. And I get a lot sorer than he does. 
And by the end of the by the end of the time, I was just exhausted, and he was too. And he went to his truck, and our last day, it also poured rain while we were outside cutting tile, and so we're walking in and out of the rain. And he had his bed of the truck. He had a, a a bed cover, and it was a lower one, and it opened with kind of a rounded deal, and he had that flipped back. Well, we get completely finished with the day. We're about to start our drive back to the Quad Cities. And I'm standing there as he's closing the tailgate of his truck. And he closes the tailgate, and he takes the uh, tailgate cover, and he pulls it. And all that rain just completely drenched him. And I'm standing, standing there watching. And I'm so curious how he's going to respond. And to God's glory... He bust out laughing. Just bust out laughing. And, it, and I shared it with Becky and Steve, by God's grace, as a believer. And I shared it with her on the way home. I said, you know, my temptation would be to say, that fits. Everything else goes wrong. Why would I expect this not? And I was so rebuked by Steve's joy in the midst of it. And, and I see Abram in many ways, in that, in that light. Look at Hebrews 11, 8 and 9. By faith, Abram obeyed when he was called to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same pro uh, promise. It's a foreign land. It's not his yet. He's living in tents. He's not living in a built structure and yet he's doing it in joy. And I think this is a helpful picture of us who live in, in the already, but also the not yet. Listen, I want you to catch that Abram visits all the same spots that Joshua's going to, or I'm sorry, uh, Jacob's going to visit when he goes through the land, and the same spots that Joshua and I the Israelites are going to visit when they go through the land. And here's the point. Abram walking through this land and putting altars is essentially foreshadowing the fact that Joshua will get this land in all these spots that he's setting up altars. You'll see Joshua enter each one of these spots, Ai and Bethel. He'll, he'll go there. He'll get these spots. But it's not just a foreshadowing of what's to come. You know what this also is? Is It's for Israel when they go in the promised land they, and when they're on the outskirts of it, they are to look back at Abram and say, you know what? Abram entered this land when it wasn't his. And he still went in. And it's not ours yet, but we should be like Abram and go into it when it's not even ours yet. You see, his actions foreshadowed what Joshua would do. But Joshua and the people were to look back and say, but we want the faith that you had when you went in and it wasn't yours either. That's the idea. Friends, I want to close by reading to you 1 Corinthians 3, 21-23. I want you to catch that God is in the midst of redeeming absolutely everything in your life. Look at what Paul says. The church is arguing over who they follow. I follow Cephas. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. They're, they're essentially saying, I, I, I'm better because I'm with him. And I'm better because I'm with him. And Paul's response is so awesome. So awesome. He doesn't say, hey, it's not right to choose guys to say you're aligned with them. It's not, it's not how he does it. You know what Paul does? He says, you're so weak. You're so weak. You're saying he's yours which implies that He's not yours. I'm telling you, they're all yours. Enjoy them all. They're all yours. Look at He says all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Listen, the present is yours. That tailgate splashing on Steve was His. How was it His? God was using that to redeem all of Steve. You see, there was a portion of Steve that wasn't fully refined. And God wanted him to exercise 
that muscle. He wanted to tear that muscle so that it could grow stronger. And Steve, in walking in obedience, is going to go from obedience to obedience. Because he handled that thing well, God might give him something worse today. Isn't that good news? And the reason it's good news, the reason it's good news is because what's happening is Steve is being transformed from glory to glory to glory to glory. So Steve is looking more like Jesus every single day. And if Steve had failed, guess what? God's good. He loves him. You know what he'll do? He'll give him something like that just again. So he can repeat that one. It'll be about the same level of pain. But when he succeeds at that one, he'll give him a greater level of pain. So that he can look like Jesus. So friends, I want to ask you, do you know that God is redeeming every fiber of your being in your pain as well as your pleasure? Do you know that He's redeeming every part of your family in your child's um, obedient behavior as well as their disobedient behavior? He's doing something in your life because of their disobedience and theirs. Are you partnering with Him in that work? Paul Tripp at the parenting conference shared a time where his son lied to him and said, I was spending the night over this guy's house, but he was really spending the night over this guy's house, which his dad wouldn't have approved of. And Throughout the weekend, the friend that he lied about, his mom called and said, hey, my son said that your son was going to use him as a lie, but it's not true. He's not sleeping at our house. And Paul said he was so angry. He was so angry. He went up to his wife and he said, I'm going to kill you. And she said, she said, Paul, you need to pray. He said, I cannot pray for him right now. She said, no, you need to pray for you. And so he started praying. And in the midst of his prayer, God started bringing some thoughts to mind. And here were a couple of them. The boy that knew he was being used as a lie probably knew that my son would never like him again for outing him. But he still had the courage to tell his mom. That was from God. Then that mom had the courage to call me and tell me about it, which had to be difficult. And God gave her the courage to do that. And he said, and all of a sudden it started hitting me that God loved my son so much that he twisted up this boy's courage to do what he did and then twisted up his mom's courage to do what she did. And I started realizing that God loves my son. And so instead of killing my son, I wanted to partner with God in loving my son. And he said, so when he came home, I didn't lose my temper like I would have. And I tried to partner with God to show him, look, God loves you. He's at work to save you. You're fighting that salvation. So turn to him. The light's better than the dark. God used that. So what I'm saying is, is that God is using everything for our good. Are you responding to it? 